In four months, Canada will choose its next government. And the truth is, some voters will enter those polls with false information in their heads. Despite warnings like Brexit, the 2016 U.S. election and other votes since. Canada is not immune to election interference. It is being targeted. So tonight we examine the forces working to deceive and manipulate because democracy only works in the light and because we don't have to be victims. Distortion is a certainty and there's no point declaring it can't happen here. It's already here. So, what are we going to do about it? About misinformation and those who would mess with our minds and elections. We tapped those who've been tracking the threat to democracies for years for some solid advice on what to watch for. Taylor Owen of McGill University studies the political impact of digital tech the way a general surveys an advancing army and with equal angst. What is different now in 2019? A third of the world is in an election year. In Canada, what are you seeing that looks different? The digital and social infrastructure that we've built, the Facebooks, the Twitter, the Google infrastructure, is pretty much the same as it was two years ago. What's wrong with this infrastructure is that it is calibrated for engagement so that the more people are enraged and engaged and ultimately divided on these sites, the more they use them and the more they post and the more they share, which is ultimately good for the platforms and the business model of the platforms. And that turns out is a highly manipulable mechanism for political speech, right? Which is inherently um, can divide us in, in very clear ways. Yeah. Radio Canada's digital journalists Jeff Yates and Roberto Roca have poured through raw data on Twitter and seen clear patterns of fakery and interference. They call their research digital archaeology, searching keywords and issues unique to Canada, discovering nefarious accounts targeting a Canadian audience, always picking at seams of division. The top tweeted tweet in English is this, Canada wants to take unvetted Muslim refugees, in quotes, detained at U.S. airports. Breaking, Canada will not allow single Syrian men to seek refuge. So you can this see is that all untrue. Justin Trudeau booed at town hall as polls show his horrific approval ratings. There seems to be a certain slant to these uh, yeah. tweets. Yeah. And the bottom line of what it told you was what? Was that uh, the two main topics, the two main divisive topics that they think that they could uh, uh, use to divide Canadians are immigration and pipelines. But Iran, Russia, and Venezuela seem quite active in talking about Canadian issues. Uh, why would Venezuela get mired in um, conversations about immigration? Well, for Venezuela, we kind of think that their goals aren't really political. We think that it's just to make money. A lot of the, the tweets that are anti-immigration have links to websites where people link to. They show some like very outrageous, very uh, provocative, uh, probably fake news about it. But there's a ton of ads on it, right? People link on it, people share it, they get ad revenue. But it's still damaging uh, because you're, once again, amplifying really negative and outrageous messages on social media, getting people riled up uh, for essentially falling for, for, for fake information just for money, basically. So Russia doesn't need the money. <laughs> this is not some kid city in St. Petersburg trying to make a few extra rubles here. What's happening there? Well, for, in Russia, a lot of these uh, were traced back to this troll farm, very famous troll farm that, you know, made the news. We even got indicted by uh, American prosecutors, the Internet Research Agency. A lot of these analysts believe that their role was really to sow division among Americans. So what the trolls are really good at finding are the main points of division in a society, right? They're quite good at studying a country's uh, internal debates, uh, their, their political um, uh, landscape. So they spend a lot of time trying to find the fissures, like the, the, the fault lines. And you can compare it to, let's say, like running your finger over like a piece of uh, fine china, right? And find that one little crack, it could be very small, but then they dig in, they dig in, they dig in, they dig in, and they start increasing that division. But if they're digging and digging and digging, mm. it'll fall apart. That is probably what they're hoping to do. And it's up to us to be aware of this and not let them. 
schools. Okay, so does that then sound like 2017 was maybe a dry run for this election period? That's possible. Um, people are still uh, manipulatable um, by using polarizing topics online. So uh, could it happen here? Yes, it could. Eyes need to be wide open now because whatever the motivation, misleading information can be cleverly disguised. That's certainly the case with the online news site The Buffalo Chronicle out of Buffalo, New York. A quick glance, and it seems legitimate. Mostly American-focused, truth to many of the stories, and recently the site has been dipping into Canadian stories and scandals, even seems to get scoops. But there are significant flaws and falsehoods. We tried getting in touch with someone connected with the site, even went to Buffalo in search of its location. You might think that wouldn't be hard. So the Buffalo Chronicle lists its address as being 610 Ellicott Street in Buffalo, New York. Well, the problem with that is the 500 block ends right at this intersection. The building down there is 640. So if 610 were to exist, it would be right here. But this building has been abandoned for years. Hi there. Adrian. Alan Bedenko. Really nice to meet Pleased you. To Thank meet you. you very Alan much. Alan Bedenko is a Buffalo lawyer who also writes on politics. He says he knows all about the Buffalo Chronicle and its publisher. Yes. These are subjects Absolutely. that make him wince. All right. He doesn't identify the sources, doesn't identify where they came from, what their credentials are, what authority they have to comment, or even how they know the information. You've marked this up like a high school teacher. I have, because it, it's, well, it offends me stylistically and it offends me substantively. It offends me stylistically because it's poorly written, but, you know, here, it's uh, among Toronto area political operatives, it's been rumored that Yakabuchi may be one of three men in possession of embarrassing information on Trudeau. And I just, but it's garbage. What rumors? From where? What are the sources? What, what, what is the nature of the embarrassing information? Personally embarrassing? Politically embarrassing? Why put that there? if you're not going right. to pull the trigger on it. None of this might matter if it weren't for the reality that some of these Buffalo Chronicle stories have gained traction in Canada. And lots of people have been entrapped by this. Yes, one, right? so if we look at the latest one, this was the most popular. So we can see here who shared it online. Um, so you can see it was shared... 1900 times uh, and generated you know 7,400 interactions so that's likes comments and and shares so um, who've we got here we've got Trudeau Follies I don't know Yellow Vest Canada uh, National Conservative News Network um, the Buffalo Chronicle shared it of course Doug Ford for Premier of Ontario so basically most of these people were roped in um, mm -hmm. um, lots and lots of Yellow yeah, Vest we, uh, so we have um, political commentator Warren Kinsella shared it. Um, he actually corrected the information later. He said, okay, this is, this is a bogus site. So once again, if you're going quickly, this might look legitimate if you're not asking yourself the right questions. But if you take a, a couple seconds to actually think critically about this, it doesn't, it doesn't stack up, it doesn't make sense. So who's behind it and why? We finally reached the editor. We're arranging for an interview when a supposed contract arrived with demands that the interview be live, unedited, with lighting being 20% softer than is typical, and a prohibition on certain words, including fabricated, fictitious, forged, fraudulent, phony, sham, crook, culprit. It went on and on. There was a threat of a quarter of a million dollar fee if the contract was breached. We said, no thanks. That Craig Silverman of BuzzFeed was one of the first journalists to recognize fake news masquerading as the real thing. And he's come to realize that just pointing out the falsehoods doesn't tend to erase them from people's minds. Somehow they stick even if they're untrue. It, it, it takes it takes effort to track these things down. It's easier to just sort of look at it, and even if you don't necessarily decide that's true, it still becomes part of the furniture of mm -hmm. yourself up there. Mm -hmm. And over time, as you know, we we read similar things and are exposed to the same information. Just the fact that we're familiar with it makes us more likely to think that it's true. Do readers and, and viewers respond well to being told that's fake, or is there a little bit of uh, pushback because people are maybe made to feel like they've fallen for something? Nobody likes to be told that 
the thing you shared, you believed, mm -hmm. is fake. Uh, it's embarrassing, and it also may go against some deeply held beliefs that that piece of information aligned with. And so we absolutely see people giving us blowback when we say, listen, that's actually not true. They don't really want to hear it. Part of what plants seeds of doubts in a voter's mind that salacious information might be true, even when told it's not, is the bombardment of falsehoods. Once you engage with it, more shows up. The algorithms on social media platforms make it so. And the more the posts trigger anger within you, the more they spread. Anger is like internet wildfire. The most vulnerable platform is, of course, the biggest, the behemoth Facebook. Roger McNamee was an early Facebook investor and advisor to Mark Zuckerberg. Now he's a forceful critic, certainly was outspoken at recent parliamentary hearings on data and the implications of its misuse. At the end of the day, though, the most effective path to reform would be to shut down the platforms, at least temporarily, as Sri Lanka did. Any country can go first. The platforms have left you no choice. The time has come to call their bluff. They didn't take that seriously. Isn't Facebook a bit too big to pull? You can't, you can't pull Facebook off a shelf, can you? No, but they could easily have made uh, changes in their business model so that sociologically inappropriate content does not get promoted. You see, the problem with Facebook, people think about it like a freedom of speech issue. You know, you can't censor speech. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that their algorithms amplify the most negative voices. And they do it because the business model is based on predicting human behavior. The fundamental underlying problem with Facebook, with Google and YouTube, with Instagram, is that their business model depends on exposing the worst in each of us. It would be wrong to say Facebook just doesn't care. It's well aware of the criticisms at times has tried to stem the tide of lies. Craig Silverman had early exchanges with the company when he was sounding the alarm about the U.S. election and falsehoods and back in 2015. In 2015, I was running a research project tracking online rumors, and I warned Facebook that I was seeing 100% false stories created by people to make money going really viral on their platform. And what they were hoping was I had some kind of a program, a computer programming or machine learning solution to say, yes, in our research project, we've been able to identify them at a very high rate, and here's all you would have to do. They want to be able to put something into their systems, program it in so that it can scale out to the 2.7 billion people that are on the platform. But a journalist working manually was not of interest to them. It's possible then that we're on our own. These platforms can't or won't fix this for us. Maybe it takes being aware that where there's tension, there's emotion, which is likely to make us react before we really question if we're being played. So that's the emotion as a news consumer you need to watch for is yes. anger. Not, not inspiration, not hope, not things that, that make you happy, but it, it's, or even sad, it's, it's when you're angry that's the red flag that there might be something up. So in an election, the anger mechanism is the most powerful. Because um, we know that anger is the most motivating emotion. Um, now, if you see something, you also need to question things that confirm exactly your view of the world. If I am also seeing things that reinforce what I know are my biases that clearly show that um, my view is absolutely correct, mm -hmm. then that is also probably being provided to me by someone who wants to torque my emotion. I worry most about the anger one, though, because I think, particularly with the foreign actors that are trying to delegitimize democracy, the most effective way of delegitimizing a democracy is to make the election itself seem Ill illegitimate, to make the other side mm -hmm. seem illegitimate. And anger is a very effective tool to do that. The best advice, don't let it happen. Ask questions, demand answers, check sources. Like it or not, it's on us. Andrew, so there's a lot to learn uh, about what's happening from the likes of Twitter, which is interesting. It has published a database that contains every tweet and account that it can link back to a state-sponsored 
operation. So researchers like Roberto and Jeff who, who from CBC who are in our story uh, can then scan that information between now and the election. They will do that. Mm. They will continue to help pointing out who is targeting Canada and how. Wow. And, and, and what about uh, bots and automated accounts? I mean, that was the big story of 2016, right? Yeah, so 2016, right? They're still out there, but the main concern now really remains real people sharing uh, fake or misleading stories with other real people. So really, it's on us to be more sharp. Yeah, and of course, CBC's team of uh, reporters will be rolling up their sleeves, showing folks how to do just that. Yeah. Okay, next on The National.